Hello, this is Math 2413, Sample Problems for Exam 2. Alright, number one, we want to find the derivative of y equals x divided by x plus y. This is clearly implicit differentiation, even though it doesn't say so, because you don't have y in terms of strictly x or any other variable. So when you have x's and y's mixed up like this, that's going to be implicit. Since this is fractional, the best way to do this would be the quotient rule. And always remember, when you're doing implicit differentiation, the key is any time you take the derivative of a y term, you put a y prime with it. Or dy dx, whatever notation you prefer, it doesn't matter, but that's because it kind of goes back to the chain rule idea. You know, you because y is a function of x, therefore dy dx. So, so we have the bottom, x plus y times the derivative of the top of x, which is 1, minus top times the derivative of the bottom. So here we go, the derivative of x would just be 1, plus the derivative of y, which would be 1 y prime. I didn't put the 1 in front, obviously, but y prime would be the derivative of y. That makes sense, right? All divided by the denominator squared, x plus y squared. All right, so I expanded this out, distributed the numerator, and because we're following a minus, those are both going to be negative. So change both those signs. The x's happen to cancel. And from there, so we have y prime equals this. I brought the x plus y squared up and over, multiplied, but basically multiplied both sides, to put it next to that y prime. So we have y times x plus y squared, which will equal that numerator of y minus xy prime. And then from there, the idea is you want to group all the y prime terms on one side. And then the non y prime terms on the other. Because what you're going to do is you're going to factor out a y prime and then divide by what you factored out. So I brought the xy prime negative, moved it over, made it positive. Now you see there's y prime terms on the left, no y prime terms on the right. Factored out a y prime. And then divided by what I factored out, which is x plus y squared plus x. And there we have it, y divided by x plus y squared plus x. Now it doesn't matter which side you, you put the y primes on, that makes no difference. But one thing to keep in mind, especially if you're taking a multiple choice type of test, is that you know, if you see answers that are completely the opposite, that's really the same thing. In other words, yes. Like, let's, you know, like negative A, for example, divided by negative B. That is the same thing as A over B. So if you had an answer and you're looking for, and you see an answer choice where every sign has the complete opposite of yours, that means that would be the same answer because you can multiply top and bottom by negative one, and that would be equivalent. All right, because it would just depend on which side the y primes are moved on. So had I moved the y prime terms to the right instead of the left, we would have had every term would have been, so since they're all positive, they would have all had negative signs, and that would have been correct. Oh, jumped ahead too far. Let's see. Number two is another implicit. The derivative of x cubed. It's 3x squared. Got a product rule in here. I kept the 2 with the x squared. Now the negative I left on the outside. So um, <laughs> if I go f prime g, the derivative of 2x squared would be 4x. So it would be 4x times y plus fg prime. 2x squared times y prime. Derivative y, which is y prime. Plus, 
and I left the 3 with the x, so the derivative of 3x is 3, and then times y squared, and then, the, then we would have 3x times the derivative of y squared, which is 2y, y prime. Now, I have the 6 here because I already have the 3 and the 2 multiplied together to save a step. But the y, don't forget the y prime. Anytime you take the derivative of a y term. So, with that being said, now the negative in front of this parentheses will distribute through and make both those negatives. So, it looks like I chose to keep the y prime terms on the left. So, I left that one. Put that one first just because it was positive and that was negative. That makes no difference, obviously, mathematically. Here, and then everything moved over. 3x squared moved over and became negative. 3y squared moved over and became negative. Now, this 4xy is negative because it's following that negative sign. So it was positive when it moved over. Now, these answers look ugly, but it's not that bad. So then I, the step I skipped here was I would have factored out a y prime, which would have left this stuff right here on the bottom, the 6xy minus 2x squared, which I would have then divided the right side by. So that's where that comes from is what was factored out of the y prime. And there we have it. Number three is another implicit. Um, so x equals cos y. So I just, I didn't put the ddx, I guess, on the other problems. But it's okay if you don't actually write that. But it just means we're taking the derivative with respect to x everywhere. Like the same thing we've been doing. So the derivative of x is 1. The derivative of cosine of y would be negative sine y. But then the chain rule, because you're taking the derivative of the inside, so and you're taking the derivative of y, so it's negative sine y times y prime. Because that derivative of the inside y would be y prime. It's probably the trickiest part of this whole problem. Now, um, pretty easy to isolate y prime if you get past this step. All you have to do is divide both sides by negative sine of y to get it over the other side. So technically, um, negative 1 over sine of y, that's correct. But it's possible on a multiple choice exam, you would have to then realize that that was the equivalent of cosecant. On a handwritten test, I probably wouldn't care that much. But, you know, with the trig sheet I always provide, that shouldn't be too difficult. Just look, you forgot and look that up. So, so therefore, y prime would equal negative cosecant y. Here's another implicit. Oh, a little uglier here. Um, let's see. So you got a y on the left and a y on the right. Okay, so basically, okay, the left side, the derivative of y would just be y prime. Now the right side is where the fun is going to be. So the, basically the derivative of sine of u is cos of u times du. Cos u du. All going back to the chain rule stuff from section 2.4 in the Larson book. So it's cos u du. So nothing happens here. We don't have a y prime yet. We don't have a y prime until we actually take the derivative of this inside part. So the derivative of x squared plus y would be 2x plus the derivative of y, which is y prime. All right, well, hopefully you have the algebra or trig skills, in this case, to realize that you don't distribute a trig function. Um, so you can't distribute that, but you can over here. It's kind of like what we have is this. We're looking at, let's say, if you had A times B plus C, like that. So it's like, then we're going B times A and C times A. So the 2X can distribute to this and just put 2X in front. Nothing's affecting the argument of that trig function. And then the Y prime distributes over there go in front of that. So it just became, and I just put this, these terms in front. So obviously, you know, if you distribute, it doesn't make any difference whether you say BA 
you know, plus CA is the same as AB plus AC. All right, this, uh, so once you get kind of get past this messiness here, it's not that bad. So now we've taken care of what we needed to do as far as the derivative. Now the rest of this is just the algebra of organizing it. So what do we got? Let's say we've got um, the y. Here's a y prime term right here. All that together. So I bring it over to the left side of the equal sign, which would then make it negative. And the other y prime is still sitting there. And then, so all you have left is this 2x cos x squared plus y sitting there by itself. So you've got everything isolated in the sense that y prime is on the left, all the y primes are on the left, and all the non y prime terms on the right. So now we factor this. Sometimes this kind of, I've seen this kind of throw people off a little bit. When they factor something, like when you're factoring out a y prime out of a y prime, there is a 1 that has to be there. I've seen people do stuff like this, and they'll factor this and just say y prime and only have like this part, the negative cosine. No, that's not correct, because one way to, to know it's not correct is it wouldn't distribute to be correct. What I have is right because y prime times 1 would be y prime, right? And then y prime times the rest of it. So, you know, if you weren't sure, you could distribute it back real quick to make sure it equal what you had. So if you didn't mess this step up right here, then you have it. So then it's just the right side divided by what I just factored out right here. And you don't have to get cute as far as trying to simplify anything here. Well, in fact, this problem you cannot simplify. Those cosines do not cancel under any circumstances here because it's with that one minus right in front of it that would not allow that to happen. It would have to be straight division before that cancels. Not mixed up multiplication and division. All right, uh, this time it's implicit, but we're finding it at um, at a point. So we're getting a numerical answer for the derivative here. And it's, it's obviously implicit because of all the mixture of x's and y's. And in other words, y is not just in terms of x. This isn't too bad to take the implicit of. So y to the fourth would be 4y cubed y prime because we're differentiating a y. And we do have a product rule inside here. So if I go f prime g, the derivative of x would be 1. So it's 1y squared for the first one. All that is following the minus, of course. So the minus stays out here, then I'll distribute it. And then this part will be x times the derivative of y squared, which will be 2y, and then always y prime. When you differentiate a y, there's always a y prime. The derivative of x on the right is 1. So um, I kind of skipped a step here, but I'll explain what I skipped. If you distribute it, it makes both those negative. So that y squared term does not have a y prime with it. So negative y squared moves all the way over to the right side and becomes plus. So it's 1 plus y squared. And then on the right side, we would have had 4y cubed y prime minus 2xy y prime. So the y prime would have factored out, and it would have left 4y cubed minus 2xy. And that's what's down there on the bottom. So it looks like I kind of skipped a step there. Now there it is. So there's your y prime. So then you put in the uh, 1 half for x and the 1 for y. Now it's just number crunching, and you'll get 2 thirds for the slope. Um, now here's one that takes it one step further, which says you can find the equation of the tangent line at that point. So take the implicit differentiation would be 4x and then minus 2yy prime. Derivative of 1 is 0. This one's pretty easy to solve for y prime, so nothing, nothing to it. Move it over, divide both sides by the 2y, so you have 4x over 2y, which reduces to x over y. So you put in the 0 0.57, so you have 2 times 5 divided by 7, so your slope is 10 over 7. So 
the same principle of finding the equation of the tangent line works like uh, it normally would in that you have y equals 10 over 7x plus b, and then you put in the x, put in the y, and then you solve for b. So it's kind of the same principle that you would have done this before. It's just you're taking an implicit derivative. So the tangent line would end up being y equals 10 over 7x minus 1 over 7. All right, now let's look at some related rate problems. So let's read what we have here. A machine is rolling a medical uh, metal cylinder. Um, radius of the cylinder is decreasing at a rate of 0 0.05 inches per second. Always remember when you see the word decreasing, that value will be negative. So you see that, and that's your so it says your radius and rate is always your derivative. So that means dr dt would be negative 0.05. Um, the volume is 128 cubic inches. Now, at what rate is the length h changing when the radius is 2.5 inches? Now, one thing. I don't like about this problem that I wish I would realize now that the wording needs to be changed here is it should say while the volume is remaining constant, the volume's not changing. That's not necessarily clear in this wording of the problem. So I would have added that in there if I was ever going to ask a question like this on a test. I would make that real clear because if the volume, anything that's constant, would have a rate of change of zero, meaning it's never changing, right? So, all right, so I wrote that in right here, but I would absolutely make the wording clearer on this for any kind of test problem, because that could be confusing. Now, here's the formula for the volume of a, of a right circular cylinder. Now, these all these kind of geometric formulas I would give to you on an exam. Now, I might expect you to know that <laughs> The area of a square is x squared, or the volume of a cube would be x cubed. But all these geometric formulas, I would absolutely give these to you. But still, though, you would have to come up with the related rate equation from that formula. I mean, taking all the derivative stuff. But I would not expect you to know v equals pi r squared h. All right, so this is uh, kind of follows implicit differentiation, but the only difference is everything is d something dt. When you take the derivative of any variable, it's d something dt. So the derivative of v would be dv dt. Now I left the pi to the outside. You could leave the pi attached to the r squared if you wanted to. So that's not, what I did is not the only way it can be done, but I left it on the outside. So I'm using the product rule. So the derivative of r squared would be 2r dr dt times h. So that's f prime g plus derivative of r, which is r, I mean, I'm sorry, r squared, which remains r squared. So it's f prime g plus f g prime times the derivative of h, which is dh dt. And then here I wrote down the radius was 2.5 inches. And then what I was talking about, about that constant volume being zero, because this would have looked like you would have had a missing value here. At what rate is the length h changing? I guess if it's rolled sideways, you, yeah. Normally you think of it as height, but I guess if it's on the side, it's length, but that's all right. At least it has the variable identified there, so. Okay, so we want dh dt. Basically, that's our unknown. Everything else we should know. So dv dt is zero, and then. 2.5 is r, negative 0.05 is dr dt. Height. Oh, we had to, had to actually solve for the height on this one, too. Excuse me, did not give the height. So if you know the volume is 128 pi and you have this formula, it's not too hard to solve for the h. Because you know the r is 2.5 inches. So 2.5 squared, all from that formula right there. 
times the unknown h equals 128 and the pi's cancel. And then you have 128 divided by 6.25, which is 20.48. So there's where your height's coming from. And then you have that uh, radius again, which is 2.5 squared, and then dh dt. And then the rest of this is just number crunching. So you would end up with height, or I guess maybe what they're referring to is length, either way, but um, that's 0 0.8, not 1, 9, 2 inches per second. In this case, it would have to be positive because if your radius is decreasing, the other variable better increase to keep the volume volume not, you know, constant, not changing. It would have to be going up to offset the decrease. Alrighty, so let's come down here. Base of a rectangle is growing larger at a rate of 5 centimeters per minute, while altitude is growing smaller at 3 centimeters per minute. At what rate is the area of the rectangle changing when its base is 40 centimeters long and its altitude is 90 centimeters? All right, area of a rectangle, pretty straightforward, just x times y, or any variable that you want to use. You can use b and h for base times height, if you'd like. That's not important. So I didn't write the individual numbers down here until I got down here, so I'll go ahead and look at this first. So we have a product rule on the right, so uh, the derivative of a would be dA dt. Uh, we'd have f prime. Looks like I want FG prime this time instead of F prime G, but that, that's okay. The, the product rule, you can go either order. Normally, I would have put the right side first, but don't know why I did it this way. X times dy dt plus the derivative of x dx dt times y. Now, the base, which is x, is growing at 5 centimeters per minute rate, which is positive. And then the altitude is growing, uh, decreasing, growing smaller. So that's decrease, same as decreasing. Three centimeters per minute, so that makes that negative three. At what rate is the area changing when its base is 40 centimeters long and its altitude is 90? So the altitude's decreasing while it's stretching really fast. So 40 times negative three then plus five times 90, and you'll get 330 square centimeters per minute because it's area. Radius of a circle increasing at five inches per minute. At what rate is the area of the rate increasing, area increasing when the radius is 10 inches? Area of a circle, pi r squared. Um, so the left side will be dA dt, and then pi is just a constant, of course, so that's not a product rule, but the 2 comes from the derivative of r squared being 2r, 2r dr dt. That one's not too bad. Um, actually, my unit, my square is in the wrong place in this answer. I promise you that will not cause you to miss a question on my exam, but I wanted to point that out. So you put in 10 radius, it's increasing, so it's positive 5 for dr dt. should be 100 pi inches squared per second. Minute. I don't even have the right letter down here. Huh. Let's see if I can, well, huh. so I'm not using a tablet here. Let me write what this would actually look like. How about inches squared minute? Well, like I just said, that will not cost you to miss a problem in my class, but that could be very important in science and engineering courses, though. So I bet I would have got penalized for that. All right, you've got a balloon rising from the ground. At eight feet per second, 
from the observer, which will be right over here. So maybe you're watching your friend go up in the balloon, you're waving at him. And so the, the balloon starts out 60 feet away from the observer, horizontal distance. So we want to know when it gets up 25 feet above the ground, it's rising at a rate of 8 feet per second at that point right there. So we have a right triangle problem. So your right triangle problems are always going to start off geometrically, which I left off. I didn't put that here. Uh, oh, we're trying to find an angle. Excuse me. Okay, I'm thinking. Uh, well, it doesn't hurt. I'll go ahead and finish my thought here. Is that you'd be starting with an x squared plus y squared plus z squared like this, or whether say be the ladder problem, you know, that's a classic problem, a ladder. And then you would it, take the derivative of that if you were trying to find any rate of change of like the maybe the distance away from the observer. Let's see if that's coming up here. No, okay. But you want to make sure you're comfortable with that and that. Oh, oh, all right, ladder problem coming up. All right, never mind. We'll see that. This is just the angle only, which I do have an angle uh, problem. Uh, talk about the angle change in my ladder problems also in my notes. So we, we know x is 60, y is 25. We know dy dt is 8. Now, what's very important where people mess this up on, on these angles is they, it, well, they make it more complicated and make it, way more difficult. You want to choose, remember anything that doesn't change has a rate of change of zero, would remain fixed. So, but anything that changes must have a variable. So if it changes, it has to have a variable. So that's why, since x will always be 60, as that balloon rises, that x is never changing. So we can always use 60 there without worrying about a rate of change. Just like the ladder problem. The length of the ladder is never changing. It remains fixed. So here, you want to choose a trig function where you only have one variable. Because it makes it easier. Because if you pick a trig function, let's say if you picked sine, that would not be good. Because sine of theta would be y over z. You would have to use two variables there. Because they are changing events there. They both change. And therefore, you got to do a quotient rule. Or you could lift up the z and do a product rule. So you'd have y over z, quotient rule. Then you got to go back and figure out what dz dt is by using the original Pythagorean equation. Now, I only want to use something involving, in this case, y, because I know dy dt, and then the number x. So the only thing that clearly makes sense here, if you've got a y here and a 60 here, and you want to use y because you had dz dt, or dy dt, I would want to, if I had dz dt, I would use c. Tangent's the only thing that makes the easiest sense to deal with. So you take y over 60, I, I explained, I don't need x there, because that's not changing. So the derivative of tangent would be sec squared theta d theta dt, and the derivative of y over 60, don't do a quotient rule here. I think I explained that on my sample one video. You know, because y over 60, some people make that way more complicated than need be. Uh, I mean, y over 60 is just 1 over 60y, like that. It's the same thing. So the derivative of 1 over 60y would just be 1 over 60. But also, though, it's 1 over 60 dy dt. So there you have it. Now let's see what we have. Uh, we're looking for d theta dt. Angle of elevation will be this angle down here from the observer. So... We're looking for that. We know dy dt, that is a value of 8, that's given. Now, we have to get what secant squared is. So this is where we have to come over here, and we have to find the value of z. We didn't need it for the related rate equation with the angle here, but we need it to be able to get the value for secant squared. 
So I'll do a little simple Pythagorean theorem, 60 squared plus 25 squared, and this one actually worked out nice. They may be some, you know, decimal approximation sometime or something. So you get uh, 65. So z happens to be exactly 65. So secant is always hypotenuse over adjacent, so it's z over x. So it's 65 over 60 would be that ratio, and it's squared because secant is squared. So it's 65 over 60 squared, d theta dt. And then you have 1 over 60 times 8. Okay, so you just kind of play around with the numbers any way you want to. You know, I just kind of flipped it around, did a little razzle-dazzle here. Just any way you want to compute it is fine. But you should get a rate of change. This will always be in radians, uh, 0.114 radians per second. And not for test purposes, but for your own curiosity, you can you want to multiply that number times 180 divided by pi. That's the conversion from radians to degrees. If you just want to see what it was in degrees, but I don't make that mandatory for exam purposes. All right. Air is being pumped into a spherical balloon at a rate of 28 cubic feet per minute. All right, cubic feet per minute, that indicates that's a volume measure, and also they're asking for the radius, so that, that proves they didn't give us the radius value, the dr dt. All right, so here's the volume of the sphere, which would be given to d equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. This one's a little nicer than that cylinder because we don't have to deal with the product rule on the right side. There's only one variable. So we have dvt, dv dt. Um, Derivative r cubed would be 3r squared, but it'd be dr dt, so the 4 comes from, when you bring down the 3, it cancels that 3, it leaves the 4, so it's 4 pi r squared dr dt. And, you know, cubic feet per minute, that does mean volume, but if you weren't sure, though, the fact is it asks what, that, what rate is the radius changing, that means it for sure it wants dr dt. So obviously you have to pay attention to what number you're plugging into. So 28 would be dv dt, put 3 in for the radius, and just uh, this 7 divided by 9 pi total. Now, one thing to keep in mind, yeah, this might not be, it might, an answer like might be this way on a test, or it might be converted to decimals. But you, a lot of people are surprised when I show this whenever in class demonstrations and stuff, but you're putting this into a calculator. Now you got to make sure you put parentheses around. You, know, you enter that in the calculator. Seven divided by nine pi. So that's how you put it in the calculator. Because uh, if you don't. It's going to think it's 7 divided by 9 and then times pi. It's going to think it's like this. Oh. It's going to think you mean that. 7 over 9 times pi. So if you divide it all in one step, then use the parentheses in the bottom. So... 7, whatever, divided by 9 pi feet per minute is. I think I, think I might have a calculator here. Let's see. No, that's okay. Go ahead and scroll down to the next problem. All right, well, it looks like we got something here. Just show you that real quick. Wrong. Right. That's the correct way to do it. All right, let's see. What about yeah. All right. So this is kind of a straightforward related rate problem. I kind of, huh. I was 
of doing these in order. This might have been the first related rate problem I would have put somewhere in the way they do it in the book, but it's no big deal. They do these kind before they do the geometric ones and stuff like that. So you've got here's your equation. So the related rate equation will be the derivative of this, which is 6x squared dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 0. So plug in what we have. What do we have here? We know that y is negative 1. It didn't give us x. So we actually had to solve for x here. So it's not too bad. You put negative 1 in there, it makes it well, obviously 1, so you get 2x cubed equals 2. Um, so you get x cubed equals 1, and it's positive 1. So we did have to solve it. It made us work a little bit and get what that x value was, but no problem. So um, dy dt is 12. We want dx dt. So there's four variables here, x, y, dx, dt, dy, dt. And now that we solve for that x, we have three out of the four. Otherwise, we would only have two out of the four. So you plug in uh, one for the x, dx, dt is your variable, y is negative one, dy, dt is 12, the derivative of three is zero. So we just kind of solve that numerically. Once you get that set up, you should never miss it to this point. So. So it ends up being positive 4. It's not too bad. 13 ladder and see what's not curious what's going on. Okay. Oh, yeah, ladder problem. That's certainly a classic test kind of problem. So got to make sure I have ladder stuff on here. Wouldn't want to be doing you a disservice by not having ladder on here. So I've got the ladder leaning against the house. Obviously, you could have the drawn the opposite, flip it over 180 degrees. But I think this is the way I usually did it. So I want to stick with that. Foot of the ladder being pulled away from the house. So a ladder sliding to the right and coming down. So it's a right triangle. Therefore, you have x squared plus y squared equals z squared. That's your starting equation, related rate equation. Then will be the derivative of that. So pretty easy. And once you see these enough, it's this kind of it's pretty automatic on the on the right triangle. 2x dt plus 2y dt 2x 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 2z dz dt. Now, then you start looking to see if anything might be zero, meaning the rate's not changing, and the latter, which I didn't write z here, but I'm sure you would have figured out that was z. Uh, dz dt is going to be uh, zero because the length of that ladder is fixed. It's not changing. So actually, that with dz dt being zero, that zeroes out the entire right side. So let's see what we have. Now, um, if x is 3, y is 4, I didn't show the Pythagorean work here. But uh, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals z squared. I guess I could sloppily put this in here. 3 squared plus 4 squared equals z squared. I'm glad my regular handwriting isn't this terrible. Anyway, you would get 5 for z from that, uh, that equation. So there's your... But kind of didn't matter anyway, though, did it? Because the whole right side just zeroed out. But just in case, there's how we would have done it. All right, pulled away. So going horizontally to the right on the x-axis, that's positive. So 0.4 per second, meters per second would be positive. But when the ladder's coming down, dy dt is going to be a negative answer. Now, you don't have to even know that in advance. Because, but, but it doesn't hurt to know that because... You know, what if they had a negative and positive answer choice? You'd be able to know for sure which one it was going to be in case you made a arithmetic mistake or something. But so ladder's coming down, so dy dt's got to be got to be negative, unless they ask you were ever asked a question: At what rate is it decreasing? So when you say something is decreasing, you can put a positive number with that. So in other words, that's uh, Kind of strange, but it 
saying something is the, the, the rate of change being uh, negative 4 feet per second is the same thing as saying decreasing at a rate of 4 feet per second because the decrease puts the negative in there with it automatically. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing. So, okay, pretty easy from here. 3 for x, 0.4 right there is your dx dt. 4 is y. Oh, you know what? I did that. I'm sorry. I did that uh, Pythagorean thing incorrectly there. My, my fault. Let me, let me fix this. Uh, the numbers are all right and everything, but we did, uh, we were solving the, I'm sorry, we didn't, we weren't solving for z as y is what we were solving for. All right. Darn it. So 3 squared plus, yeah, we had to solve for that y like that. Excuse me. Because the latter length, the 5, was given. And then you would get 4 from there. Glad I caught that now. So, yeah, we had to get that 4 right here. And then dy dt is our unknown. So once you have the numbers in there, you should be home free from there. And then it's just easy arithmetic. But getting to that part is the hard part. I don't want to undo that. <laughs> Get rid of this. 